Alright, so this is one of the biggest objections and the most important, um, it's probably the most uh, frequently occurring in uh, mock trial or in real trials, and it is known as hearsay. I'm sure you've all heard of uh, the hearsay objection before, um, and a lot of people don't really understand exactly what it means, um, but they sort of have a basic conceptual understanding. So we're going to break this down so it's easy to understand. And we're going to start out with the definition of hearsay. So hearsay is, by definition, an out-of-court statement offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. This definition should be memorized. And when I say memorized, I mean you should be able to say this in your sleep. So according to the hearsay rule, hearsay is generally inadmissible. Uh, there are various exceptions to this general rule, but in order to understand these exceptions, you need to understand why hearsay is generally inadmissible. So we're going to start, um, just break it down as to why hearsay is not allowed in trial. So first, cross-examination. So every lawyer has the right to cross-examine anyone that brings testimonial evidence against them. Uh, if you can consider this example, a police officer investigates an alleged crime and conducts a series of interviews. He receives incriminating information from the defendant's enemies that implicate the defendant in the crime. Now, without the hearsay rule, the police officer would be allowed to testify to everything these individuals said, and the defendant would be unable to cross-examine the individuals, accusing them of wrongdoing. Now, this is fundamentally unfair. And this is why the Constitution contains the Confrontation Clause. Now, the prosecution must call each witness that the police officer interviewed if they wanted to enter all of that information into the record. However, by doing this, the defense is able to cross-examine each of these witnesses and challenge the witness's credibility. So that's a perfect segue into the second reason why hearsay is inadmissible, and that's credibility. So in general, it's not hard to tell when someone is lying or bending the truth. Since a trial is essentially in search for the truth, we want people to have to come to court, uh, take an oath to tell the truth, and then testify under that oath. By making witnesses appear in court to testify, the jurors can look the witnesses in the eyes as they tell their story and decide whether or not this person should be believed. Now lastly, the last reason why hearsay is inadmissible in court is something known as first-hand information preferred. Essentially, trials uh, went to, or jur juries, judges, and trial courts want to hear straight from the horse's mouth. The court prefers first-hand information over second-hand information. You can think of the old telephone game. You go around in a circle repeating what was told to you, and by the end of the game, the original message has been completely changed. The courts recognize the decreasing reliability of information as it passes from source to source. That is why the courts prefer a first-hand account of what an individual saw or did rather than a recap of what that person saw or did from another person. So now that we understand sort of the policy considerations behind the hearsay rule, let's break down the definition into three parts. One, out-of-court statement. Two, declarant. And three, offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. Alright, so let's start with the first one. Out-of-court statement. So, almost every verbal utterance that is made outside of court, both oral and written, constitutes a statement. So, if I testify that someone told me he saw Lauren buying drugs, the statement, I saw Lauren, Lauren buying drugs, is being made by that person and relayed to me. This is secondhand information. It isn't as reliable as if that person takes the stand and testifies, I saw Lauren buying drugs. Now, a document with writing on it is also a statement, which at first sort of may be hard to grasp, but 
um, it is considered the same as an oral statement. So a bank record, a receipt, or a business memorandum constitutes a hearsay document. Now, not every statement constitutes hearsay. For example, a command is not hearsay. If I say, give me the remote, I am commanding you to give me the remote. I am not making an assertion of truth. Similarly, questions are not hearsay statements. Remember this saying, questions seek truth, they don't assert it. So if I ask, what time is it? That is not a hearsay statement. Finally, nonverbal assertions can constitute hearsay statements. An easy to remember example is giving someone the middle finger. The message for this is well understood. However, for it to constitute a hearsay statement, it must be intended as an, ass as an assertion. So that's where the word assertion comes in. Therefore, if I point at something on a menu with my middle finger, and I am not intending to convey a derogatory message, I'm simply pointing at something on a menu. So that would not be hearsay. Alright, so next we want to go over the fact that there has to be a declarant. In order for a statement to be hearsay, there pretty much needs to be a declarant. And a declarant is a person who makes the statement. So if there's no declarant, there is no hearsay. Therefore, if I testify that I saw the license plate STR442, this is not hearsay because a license plate is not a declarant. By the same logic, if I look at the clock and confirm that it is 7 p.m., that is not hearsay because the clock is not a declarant. And lastly, hearsay is offered to prove the truth of the matter asserted. So, once you have determined that something constitutes a statement and was made by a declarant, so the first two are checked, you need to determine the purpose of the statement. If I testify that Jimmy told me that he saw the robbery, assuming that I am offering this statement to prove the truth of the matter asserted, that Jimmy did in fact see the robbery, this is inadmissible hearsay. In essence, if you are trying to prove the words inside the quotation marks to be true, then you are eliciting inadmissible hearsay testimony. Next, we're going to go over some non-hearsay uses. By non-hearsay, this means that it's not an exception to the hearsay rule, but rather it is simply not hearsay at all and should be allowed in court. So. Just a quick overview, um, some of the non-hearsay uses are impeachment, party opponent, proof of effect on the listener, circumstantial evidence of state of mind, and circumstantial evidence of memory, knowledge, or belief. So we're going to start with um, impeachment. So, when you use a document to impeach a witness, you are reading a portion of an out-of-court statement into the record. However, the purpose of this process is not to prove the truth of the statement in the affidavit. The purpose is to demonstrate that the, witness, the witness's in-court testimony contradicts what is written, written in the witness's affidavit. So essentially you're showing that the witness cannot and should not be trusted. And uh, basically the jury should not believe what the witness is saying. So that's the purpose of impeachment. Next we have party opponent. So this is perhaps one of the most important non-hearsay uses you will come across. In a criminal case it says that any statement made by the defendant is admissible. Uh, the rationale for this is that anything the defendant says should be free game in trial. In criminal cases, only the state has a party opponent. The defendant does not have one. So in a criminal case, the prosecution would be the only party allowed to use this, uh, this non-hearsay use. Next, we have 
proof of effect on listener. So this can also be read to uh, say the proof of effect or lack of effect on the listener. So keep that in mind. So basically, if you're introducing a statement solely to show the effect or lack of effect it had on someone, then it is not hearsay. If a plaintiff suffers a damaged retina uh, while using his new power saw and sues the power saw com company for failing to warn of this particular danger, the defendant company could do the following. They could um, essentially try to prove the effect of the, um, the sorry, the, the warning that the label provided and the lack of effect it had on him in using the power saw. Similarly, a statement can be used as the basis for subsequent action. So uh, lastly, a statement can be used to provide motive or lack thereof. So that's pretty important. Um, all right, let's talk about the state of mind non-hearsay use. So a statement that provides circumstantial evidence of a declarant's state of mind will be admitted as non-hearsay. Now, consider this hypothetical example. The plaintiff sues an employer um, claiming that their promotion process is racially discriminatory and they sue them under this 1964 Civil Rights Act. So the plaintiff introduces a statement made by the employer stating black people are lazy. This is certainly circumstantial evidence of the employer's state of mind which is relevant to prove the employer's discriminatory intent in choosing to promote certain white individuals rather than black individuals. If it helps, you can also think of why this is not hearsay based on the definition. We are not trying to admit this evidence to prove that black people are lazy. We are admitting it to show that the employer is racist. So in this case, we're showing the employer's state of mind. Lastly, circumstantial evidence of knowledge, memory, or belief. So if a statement is being used to show circumstantial evidence of a declarant's knowledge, memory, or belief, it is a non-hearsay use. Here's a hypothetical. Amy was kidnapped by Derek. She is too traumatized to testify in his criminal trial. However, Amy's mother takes the stand and testifies to the contents of Amy's diary. In it, she talks about Derek's apartment, bedroom, and kitchen. The only way Amy would know anything about these places is if she was kidnapped. Therefore, this testimony was admitted because it was circumstantial evidence of Amy's knowledge of Derek's apartment, which is relevant because it makes it more likely Derek kidnapped her. So we aren't offering the evidence to show that the defendant's apartment was a certain color. We are offering it to show that Amy knew the color of the apartment. Alright, so let's go to hearsay exceptions. So we just covered what's not hearsay and what is allowed in court. And here are some examples of what actually is hearsay, but is an exception to the rule. So, the rationale for hearsay exceptions is that there are certain situations where second-hand information is just as reliable as first-hand information. If you think about it, um, it makes sense. If the circumstances are such that the statement's truthfulness can be reasonably trusted, then logically the statement should not be excluded simply because it is hearsay. Not all of the hearsay exceptions will become applicable during the year. Here are common exceptions that are more likely to come up. So, the first one being present sense impression. So, these statements are admissible because the immediacy requirement reduces the risk of memory loss and deception. There are three requirements for this exception to apply. So it has to be immediate. Um, the speaker must have perceived what she describes, and it has to be descriptive. So the statement must describe an act, event, or condition. Uh, the next one is known as excited utterance. 
the spontaneity of these statements is what makes them reliable. So there are also three requirements that must be satisfied. One, there must be an external stimulus. There needs to be an exciting event that grabs the attention of the declarant. The declarant must be under the influence of the external stimulus when making the statement. And lastly, the statement must be related to the exciting event. So an example of this is a mother who yells, help me, that car just hit my son. That would be uh, an excited utterance because one, it is responding to an external stimulus. Two, the mother is under the influence of that stimulus. And three, the statement is related to that event, the event being the car hitting her son. All right, the third hearsay exception is business records. This actually has a uh, far-reaching scope. Uh, this reaches almost any document that is business related. Anything from receipts to computer databases uh, fall within this exception. There are specific requirements for establishing a business record, and they are as follows. One, it must be a regularly kept record. And two, um, the source must be a person with personal knowledge of what is recorded and must be acting in the course of employment. Uh, three, contemporary, uh, sorry, contemporaneity. Uh, when a record reflects an event, like a purchase, the record must be made close to the time of the event. Reports made long after the transaction would not qualify. And four, there has to be a foundation testimony. The person must testify how the record is prepared so that the court knows whether it is kept reliably. So if you want to use this exception, it may take uh, a long time to establish those four requirements. Um, but if you do feel that the evidence is important enough, you can definitely get it through. Now, the fourth one is known as a dying declaration. So the rationale is rather archaic, but it basically says that a person who believes they are on their deathbed is unlikely to lie. And there are two elements that must be satisfied. One, settled expectation. The declarant must believe that death is imminent and unavoidable. It only suffices if the declarant believes death is mere moments away. So someone who has a illness that um, would cause them to die in, say, nine months would not qualify under this um, hearsay exception. And secondly, uh, it must be concerning cause or circumstances. So the statement need not describe physical cause of death or injury. It is sufficient that the statement concern the cause or circumstances. So it has to relate um, to the cause or circumstances, essentially. So for this one, there are two requirements. All right, um, the fifth one is a statement against interest. So this one actually um, is pretty self-explanatory, but the rationale is that a person does not say something against their interests unless it is true. Aside from the witness being unavailable, the only requirements for this exception are that the statement is against the declarant's interest, and the declarant must understand that it is against their interest. And so that one, uh, I'm pretty sure you can understand. Now, there may be circumstances where there are multiple levels of hearsay, and this is what is known as hearsay within hearsay. This may be somewhat confusing at first, um, but it does come, come up often enough that you should know how to deal with it. So here's an example. Mike told me that Lindsay told him that Bobby is gambling at the casino. So that's sort of a he said that she said sort of situation. And another example is a medical document that says the patient complained of chest pains. 
not only is the medical document hearsay, but within that, the patient is complaining of chest pains, which is also a statement. So in these situations, the important thing to know is that both levels of hearsay must be dealt with during the objection argument. For example, arguing that the medical document is a business record is insufficient. You must also offer an exception in order to admit the statement made by the patient that is contained within the record. Hearsay statements contained within a document may be redacted if you attempt to enter the document into evidence. Alright, so that concludes hearsay. That was quite a long um, objection to deal with, but uh, once you understand the basics, uh, you should be fluent enough with the hearsay objection to respond sufficiently to your opposing counsel's um, objection in court. And next up, we have character evidence. Thank you.